Hello, everybody, and welcome again to our online open course as part of the Threatened Species Initiative, uh, Conservation Gen Genomics for Threatened Species Management. So today I'll be going over the principles of population genetics, uh, in particular different genetic metrics, including genetic diversity, heterozygosity, inbreeding, and richness, and why they're important. And my name is Dr. Kate Quigley, and I'm joining you from Mindaroo Foundation today. So there's a number of different relevant metrics for conservation genomics applications. And if we look here in this little diagram uh, put together by the Threatened Species Initiative, we can see that step one has to do with collecting our samples using some kind of sequence, sequencing technology to sequence those samples to get the genomic and transcriptomic information that we desire, uh, work with that genomic data, and finally there's some kind of interpretation um, in a genomic report for the implementation of different conservation actions. So for this genomic report we need to really put together metrics that are based on this genomic information. And some of the metrics that we often look to uh, to help inform these decisions include estimates of genetic diversity, how to tie that genetic diversity to associated ecological traits of interest in different species that we're working with, as well as some degree of inbreeding relatedness uh, between populations, between species, as well as the phylogenetic relationships amongst species um, in areas of conservation action. So oftentimes these are the metrics that um, we're looking to report on in these uh, genomic reports uh, for some kind of action. So oftentimes what we hear about is this crisis in biodiversity loss, but going hand in hand with that is really a crisis in genetic diversity loss as well. So oftentimes we think about genetic diversity or we think about genetics as this combination of uh, A, T, Cs, and Gs, and this was nicely, kind of the loss of this genetic diversity was nicely illustrated um, in a recent science uh, article where around the world, not only are we losing different species as, at accelerating rates, but we're also losing the genetic diversity associated with populations of species um, at the same time. And so when we start to think about what is genetic diversity, that really is about the genomic variation or that variation in genetic architecture that makes up that different species. And these are measured by something we call polymorphisms or changes in the allelic richness of these different ATCs and Gs that exist within a species. And these changes can often be, they can be positive, they can be negative, um, but they're most often neutral. So changes, genetic changes are most often have no effect on the fitness or the ability of that organism uh, or population or species to persist and uh, reproduce and carry on its traits. Um, but when standing, that standing genetic uh, diversity starts to become eroded because of disturbance, um, that's a problem. And oftentimes the standing genetic variation of a population or a species if, is often related to different climate traits, especially uh, in these days of climate change impacts. And in plants, this can be something like desiccation tolerance, so the, the likelihood of a uh, plant being able to survive under high temperatures, or for example, on coral reefs, the ability of corals to withstand uh, bleaching temperatures that cause them to potentially die. And so this kind of erosion of standing genetic variation ties hand in hand with the erosion to adapt rapidly. So because genetic variation is the fuel for adaptation, um, through the, the work of selection, when we start to lose genetic variation, variation, we start to lose the ability to adapt rapidly. And so oftentimes you're doing association tests where you're trying to understand the relationship between the genotype or that genetic architecture with some kind of environmental uh, information of that species. And these are often boiled down into metrics like intraspecific diversity, species richness, as well as ecosystem functioning and resilience. So we're always trying to tie these genomic 
metrics with some kind of larger scale, either environmental or ecosystem metrics. And I'll just give a small case study example in corals. And we've really been looking at genetic diversity or this, these patterns of standing genetic variation around the world, especially different regions um, of high and low diversity. And what we've been able to see is that across different species and across different regions, there's a large amount of variation when it comes to uh, standing genetic diversity. And again, this is trying to understand if standing genetic diversity is associated with the ability for selection to work on these different populations or species, what is their propensity to adapt and evolve into the future under different disturbance regimes? And all I'll say about this is that we're still trying to unpack relationships between uh, diversity and region and species, um, but that there is associations between having very low genetic diversity and high propensity for potential um, uh, extinction. So another metric aside from genetic diversity that we often hear about is inbreeding. And this is where um, inbreeding is really exacerbated by small population sizes and small population sizes uh, occurring after some kind of disturbance event potentially kills a large number of individuals in a population. And this becomes uh, very worrying because it can lead to genetic bottlenecks. And in this figure, um, we can really see the impacts of something called an extinction vortex where we have this small population of individuals of different genetic backgrounds symbolized by their uh, DNA double helix in different colors signifying genetic diversity. And some disturbance event has wiped out a large number of individuals. So now we have a small population that leads to inbreeding and a lower subsequent lower genetic diversity. And that means that genetic drift, which is the impact of just random changes occurring uh, in the genome uh, genomes of these individuals has a greater effect because there's fewer individuals. And that goes on to impact on uh, reproductive success, <coughs> leading to lower fertility and thereby increasing the decline of the population, increasing higher mortality. And at the end, we get this loss of adaptability. So this population has now had an erosion of genetic diversity over time due to various different mechanisms, all started by uh, lower population sizes. So this really is a vortex because once this process uh, kicks off, it is very hard to rescue species that are on this trajectory. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, different uh, practitioners are really trying to tie in the extinction risk uh, with genetic diversity and the impacts of inbreeding to try to understand what is the context of this kind of the possibility for an extinction vortex for different species. And I'll just uh, quickly talk about this figure here to remind people that as part of the IUCN red list, um, Organisms can be classified in different categories from least concern of extinction risk uh, down to, unfortunately, when a species is listed as extinct. So there's a range of different crisis categories that organisms can be contextualized in. So um, going along with this, um, it was found many years ago in a really nice study looking at butterflies that, yes, there was a relationship between uh, the overall genetic diversity, and in particular, a decline in genetic diversity and extinction risk. Um, however, in other organismal groups where we can see along the x-axis here, the different categories of IUCN uh, metrics that I just, uh, just reviewed, and we can see that there was actually no relationship between different primate groups um, and the overall genetic diversity uh, in, this, uh, in these different groups. And then in corals, like what I discussed before, potentially um, there is a relationship. Again, a lot of variability, but I'll just point out that particular species in uh, a particularly threatened region do have incredibly low genetic diversity. So potentially, um, although the it's quite complex for different taxa, what the direct relationship between 
uh, extinction risk, genetic diversity, and inbreeding is, it is uh, something that potentially is quite informative for many taxa. And if no signal is found, for example, in these primates, it could potentially mean that the precipitous drop in those populations going towards extinction is actually so fast that it's actually not able to be detected in some of the genetic metrics that we're studying. So that really suggests that we're losing species so fast that potentially some of these metrics are, are actually cannot detect um, the level of impact that they're really under, including extremely threatened primate species. Um, so because of the importance of uh, population size for many of these genetic metrics, I'll just spend a little bit more time explaining the linkage between population size um, and uh, inbreeding depression. And uh, this, this is really stems from the fact that many new mutations, if they're not neutral, they can actually be deleterious or have a negative effect on fitness of these different organisms. And so the idea is that as population size increases, there is a buffering effect in that selection increases for a lower mutation rate. So in very large population sizes that are healthy and have a large number of uh, individuals reproducing in them, that there is a strong selective pressure to keep mutation rates down. So that essentially keeps the deleterious impact of these new mutations down. The problem arises when population sizes become small and that selective pressure um, is therefore released. And um, you know, classic examples of small population sizes um, occur in cheetahs, for example. And this is really uh, underscored uh, in theory by something called the drift barrier hypothesis, where um, again, as population size increases, uh, selective, uh, that pressure for selection uh, on mutation rate decreases. So you start to get an imbalance in that where mutation now has a greater uh, potential to have deleterious effects as population size decreases. So because of this inverse relationship between population size and mutation rate, that is essentially the crux for why having a small population becomes so critically risky um, over time. And that is due to the impact of deleterious mutation um, on these populations. So I'll just close off with a little bit about how phylogenetic relationships are tied into these uh, genetic metrics. And again, talking about um, the different primate examples. And what we can see is that on a tree such as this, um, the branch lengths uh, between different individuals, so that characterizes the relationship of different species to each other, is dictated by the number of substitutions per site. So that has to do with the genetic diversity um, differences in these uh, different taxa across the tree of life. And this is so important because again, what we're interested in is effective population size, the number of individuals that are breeding within a population and thereby creating uh, different uh, combinations of genetic diversity that uh, selection can act upon and essentially become the fuel for uh, selection and adaptation to happen. And so um, phylogenetic relationships can actually can be confounded by different mutation rates. So that is the linkage uh, with effective population sizes and why it's so important to understand phylogenetic relationships. And finally, it is important that um, sometimes you can get something called phylogenetic inertia in where in which it looks like there is no potential for trait evolution, for example, heat tolerance, desiccation tolerance. So all of these kind of metrics that we're interested in understanding to understand uh, how at risk certain species are, um, but that those can be confounded um, by different ways of constructing these phylogenetic relationships. So um, I guess that's to say that we should take caution um, when trying to look at trait evolution when we don't quite understand the phylogenetic relationships across different taxa, but that it's still helpful to contextualize, again, adaptation potential of different species. 
So with that, um, I would just like to remind people to look at the other modules that are available as well and uh, thank all the different uh, contributors to the Threatened Species Initiative. Thank you.